philosophies behind the brutality that was used in World War II, not only with the murder of the Jews, but did you notice that when cities were bombed, they went in and flattened cities? Not just military installations. Civilian cities were flattened. Why did they do that? It seems that that is just a brutal, heartless thing to do. The other argument is, that's the way you win a war. Is you break your opponent's will to fight. And when you go in and flatten cities, and not just one or two, but you go in and just start completely flattening cities, pretty soon they say, okay, that's enough. Stop, stop, stop. We give up. Stop, stop. This is too much. That's what happened to, with the Japanese when they dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Japanese people said, whoa, 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 whoa. You've crossed the line here. This is too much, too much. Stop, stop, stop. We give up. We give up. That's the way you win a war. And that's the second argument. Actually, the way to win a war is to not go to war in the first place. But apparently mankind doesn't seem to be able to do that. Instead, during this last 20th century, we seem to be more brutal than we've ever been before. As a human race, not just as America or other countries, as a human race, we're more brutal now than we've ever been before. And you can see on cities everywhere what just happened in the U.K., when the guy went and hacked a soldier to death and then stood there covered with blood and waited for the cops to come and arrest him and the whole time spewing all this rhetoric about how nobody is safe, blah, 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 blah. They just have no problem just hacking people to death. We see the same thing here in America, not hacking people to death necessarily, but you see – Gangs of roving kids who beat up the elderly just for the fun of doing it. People stepping over people who are injured, laying on the sidewalk, bleeding, bleeding, maybe dying, and they step right over them. What about Second Timothy in the time of the Gentiles? Nehemiah 2.4 says chariots will rage through the streets with lightning protruding from their head or from the front of the chariots as they bump into each other. Stand on an overpass in any major city at rush hour in the evening. What do you see? You see speeding chariots who, who rage through the highway with lightning protruding out of the front of them, bumping into each other. Crowded freeways with their headlights on. What about the um, one world religion that's coming about through this ecumenical movement? Now, I'm not going to say that the Pope is, is going to be this false prophet. However, he is – the Catholic Church is the one that's pushing for this ecumenical movement, saying that all paths lead to God. He came to save everybody, that it doesn't matter how you get there. They all lead to God. All paths lead to God, that you don't need Jesus. You don't need to have a relationship with in order to go to heaven, that he died for everyone and everyone's going. Well, you know what? When I walk through the cities and towns, when I visit other towns and, and states, some of the big cities, there's some people there that I don't want to be heaven with. There are people there that are going to make it not heaven. Do you see what I'm saying? If everybody goes, if every all could lead to God, and everyone's allowed into heaven, then it's not going to be heaven, is it? It's going to be the same pit that we're in now. But yet, for some reason, this basic common sense seems to elude everybody. People are breaking into your house, and they're killing your dog, pulling the cat to the front door, and stealing your car, and raping your kids. You're going to be in heaven with those people. All paths do not look to God. The ecumenical movement is it's not biblical. The Catholic Church is the head of that ecumenical movement. Just like I talked in a past program, 
the Pope being a Jesuit and all of his cronies also being Jesuits, you know, the Jesuits are big astrologers. They're big on things in outer space, on the stars, on the moon, on sun, on extraterrestrial life. This whole the whole the whole movement that says, Well, I'm a good person, so I'm going to heaven because because the truth of God's word's not being preached anymore. That's that's the really scary part about this. And preach to teachers and pastors are not preaching on hell and damnation. They're not teaching that people are guilty. The Bible says no man is righteous, no not one. It says no not one. No man and man, not just being men, but mankind. There is no one in mankind who is righteous. No not one. Now, for you Catholics, that's going to be a problem because you think that Mary was holy and sinless. The Bible says no one is sinless. God himself is the only one that was sinless. And he says no one is righteous. No, not one. No one is clean. No one. He didn't say no one except Mary. He said no one, no, not Fun. What about what about this uh, language that's supposed to come back? You know, it says I have it here somewhere. I did. Let's see if I got my ducks in a row here or not. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm pretending that I have it all in front of me right here. Yeah, I, and Isaiah says that a nation will be born in a day. Men will fly out of the nest. The restoration of Israel. He will gather his people back. He says he will bring back the pure language. What is the pure language? The pure language at the time that that was written, was Hebrew. Hebrew was lost. It's lost language. 1,500 years of Hebrew was lost. Nobody spoke it. Nobody used it. It was a, it was an extinct language. Now it's back. This is the first time in human history that a language has been extinct for 1,500 years and then comes back. It's being taught in schools. People are using it in their daily lives. They're using it in the stores, in the marketplace. Hebrew is now becoming a eternal language. Never before in human history has that happened. Never before. The thing that this is going to be also, this one world religion is going to encompass everyone. This is going to also, in my opinion, just my opinion, this is going to be part of the great falling away because of the greed and the utter gutlessness of pastors and preachers and teachers to actually preach on the end time, to preach literally on sin and redemption, repentance, what it means that you can't be saved without these things. Not that it's by works, but by this is proof of your salvation. It doesn't bring you salvation. It's proof. We all know and understand we are in a world system that this world government is coming about. You know, I, I really have to, I really have to wind this back to the most influential country in the world, the country that that really dictates a lot of things in the world, and that's America. You know, there's a there's a reason why other countries call America the great saint. Things, some things that are normal for us are, are biblically outrageous. 
be outrageous. Not only through prosperity preachers who are out to make a buck and who are violating God's law when they go in for this tax exemption because Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. And these prosperity preachers are refusing to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay taxes. They want to tax you into oblivion? Pay it. Because it will be returned to you when God returns. Do what God told you to do. Give to you what is Caesar. Give God is God's. I need to rationalize it. I don't need to explain it. God has his reasons. He said do it. So do it. No, no, no. They're not doing it. They're prosperity preachers. They want all of the money they can possibly get. How many of these guys have been under indictment? Questlow Dollar. How many of these other people, uh, you see pictures of their homes, and it's a giant mansion on 500 acres, and they've got two or three Harleys outside of the front door next to their Bentley. Is that God's plan? According to them, it is. Well, I'm doing his work, so he's prospering me. And you can prosper, too. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, boy. I think it makes a fundamental difference. People who actually preach the word, preach salvation and damnation and repentance, as opposed to those prosperity preachers who are bringing about this ecumenical movement. You know, Rick Warren is is a big part of this. Uh, I mean, I could name name other names. These people who are are creating Christians in name only. Look, there's only one way to know if, if you personally have a real relationship with Christ. Now, you may say, yes, I'm a Christian because I said the prayer and I give my tithes and I go to church. And I do that because I want to be obedient to God. But yet, you step right out of that and step right back into sin. Without repentance. Repentance Repentance is changing your mind. Once you change your mind, your actions will follow. God says for you to repent. Change your mind about it. Your actions follow. There are people that have no repentance because they think that the things of the world that they do that are sins against God are okay. That it's okay for them to do that because they're saved by grace and faith. Well, you can know if you're a true Christian, if your relationship with real Israel is, and, and here's the way to know. Ask yourself a question and be honest with yourself. Has your relationship with Christ, has what he did on the cross turned your life upside down? Upside down. Have you been completely 100% changed from the inside out as a person, as in the way you think and act and move by the power of the cross? If you have not, you're not a Christian. Because a true relationship with God will turn your life upside down. It is an experience that that is undeniable, and it's something that you say you can't say. I think I think I have it. I I think I have this relationship. Well, I you know I I said the prayer. You know I asked him into my heart. That's all I have to do. Friends, don't be deceived. He says that many perish because of lack of knowledge. He said, many will come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. He said, depart from me, you who work with with Nick. I never knew you. How do you square that? How do you square that? For you folks that say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I am. But yet your life has not been turned upside down. Your life has not been completely changed. You don't have a completely 100% turnaround attitude. Not necessarily in your actions. In your heart, in your mind, in your thinking. A 100% change. Upside down. 
Houston. On that 